Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs and the host of Vegas Rock Dog Radio. On today's show, I'm talking about Cushing's disease. So stay right there. everyone welcome to the show i'm your host sam the queen of rock and roll dogs and this is vegas rock dog radio we are a rock and roll show all about pets people and pop culture but before we even get cracking on today's show let's tell you who's in studio we always have the same very very important guests (laughs) and they are well they're really my co-hosts we have mr twix and Miss Thornton and Galaxy looks down on us to make sure we give you a great show every single week. Now, uh, producing the show is the famous Mr. Jim. Hello, Mr. Jim. Hi. Quite famous. You say this <laughs> most <laughs> random things. I am quite famous. <laughs> Jim is the Jim is the the expert in one and two word answers, I'd or say sometimes one letter when you're texting. Okay. Correct. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Thornton just took her throne. Oh, did she? Yeah. She has her own poang, Ikea poang in the studio. And that's how it should be. Apparently, her name was Princess before we rescued her. Which was the name of my dog growing up. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so <laughs> she doesn't, doesn't seem like a princess, although she is, w- we call her the supreme comfort dog because... She has to be comfortable like a princess. And so she likes a triple stack bed. She likes an Ikea poang. <laughs> she loves a blanket any time of year, even when we're in the height of summer. I mean, of course, bear in mind we have AC on, but she loves a blanket and she loves it on her head. And, um, yeah, so she, I guess she is a princess in, in one respect. You know, she uh, if you saw her triple stack bed, it's a little bit like Princess and the Pea. <laughs> it really is, and uh, Mr. Twix. Well, he doesn't doesn't really. C- he'll, he'll sleep anywhere. At one point, it was only the floor, wasn't it, Jim? It was at the very beginning. When or hiding in places, and yeah, under clothes or on clothes. Oh, he loves dirty laundry. Oh, does he love dirty laundry? But he has now become accustomed to other things like comfy beds. In fact, last night, Jim and I haven't shared the photo with you. I came to bed and I thought, I'm not sure where I'm going to sleep. But if you'd have seen the picture of him, he looked like a tiny drunk. He was on his back, legs up in the air, didn't care. And um, he's now become accustomed to, I say, more than just the hard, f- the hard floor, you know. But he, uh, he's, he's a funny little boy, isn't he, Jim? In fact, I'm going to tell you what he's just done. Mm. He has just done <laughs> to my hard work. We've got our 80s hairball coming up on March 22nd here in Vegas at Three Sheets Craft Beer bar and that's our big fundraiser of the year rocking for rescues and we do a mega raffle and auction i mean seriously i i feel like some of the raffle prizes that that you're going to win are better than what you'll see at other fancy auctions i mean our stuff is that good anyway we're about to you know start the show where is he 
come, he needs to come in the studio. Where is he? Where is he? Then I walk in the living room and it, he's got a ball and it's got a it's got the the uh, the tag on it still from the company. And I'm looking at the ball and I'm thinking, I don't recognize this ball. Where's he got this ball from? And then I look over to the gazillion raffle baskets that I've done in auction baskets and I've done a lot of them. They're all they're all enclosed in a huge cellophane bag, yeah, tied up. Oh no, Mr. Twix has ripped it open <laughs> and mm -hmm. stolen a ball. Stealth. Here's the thing. He obviously recognizes a ball, and there are probably about 20 items in that basket, yeah? Dog bowl, toy, da -da. He wanted that. He recognized that ball, and he wanted that ball. Anyway, he's wrecked. <laughs> I'll post a picture. Everything he does makes me laugh, though. He's wrecked <laughs> wreck the basket. But you know what? He's clever. He's like, hmm, there's a ball in there. I'm having that ball. Yep. And this is how I'm getting that ball. Yep. And then we had to entice the ball off him with a treat. So it doesn't always fall for it, does he, Jim? Yeah. He knows. After he got his treat and he went back to where the To ball look for was. it. And then he was a bit like, I know I left it back here. Anyway, I will post a picture because, you know. <laughs> you see, that's how good the raffle baskets are. Even the dogs want everything that's in the raffle basket. So <laughs> anyway, so that's what happened this <laughs> this very minute. Um, so if you're new to the show, welcome to, to the show. And oh, he's 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 very curious today, Mr. Twist. I've got to say, he's all over in the studio right now. He's not a bit settled. He looks like he's trying to to entertain himself in one way or another. But uh, welcome to the show if you are brand new to the show. And of course, big hello to our regular listeners. It's always great to make sure we've got our regulars here. If you want to connect with us elsewhere for the show, like where is the show on the online? This is where we are: VegasRockDogRadio.com. It's our main website, and that's where you can listen to the show and catch up on archive shows. You'll catch us also on Periscope, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, and Instagram. And we do have a blog. The blog is therockandrolldog.com. And if you do miss the show, unfortunately a live show, then you can catch us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spoke by SiriusXM, Spotify, and any other podcast app you may have on your phone. Just search Vegas Rock Dog Radio. And on iTunes, you can also search Pet Tip of the Day. That's our other little show that goes out as well. And uh, that's pretty much everywhere that <laughs> you can find us. You know, there's a new there's a new platform called Wemo. I think it's called Wemo. Wemo. Um, that could be promising. It seems like a lot of people are leaving Facebook and going over to Wemo. And um, I kind of like how the whole thing's laid out. So I might venture into that. But, you know, I think with any kind of social media, you've just got to be... <laughs> You've got to be smart about how you use your time on social media because you could be on there all day. And, um, you know, just one more platform is usually a bit more work. So, But Wemo is the one I'm going to take another look at. Well, before we get onto our main topic of Cushing's disease, and you do hear about it a fair amount, and we've got a friend whose dog was recently diagnosed with it, I wanted to do our tip of the week. Yeah, is Mr. Twix not in trouble? Because that's a good thing if he's not in trouble. He's okay right now. He's <laughs> getting settled. When he gets quiet, well, I, I think everybody relates to that. When your dog's quiet, you go, hang on. I guess that's the same if you've got kids, toddlers, if they're quiet. What's he doing? <laughs> Just had to stop him from licking. <laughs> yeah, we're coming into the season where mulberry starts to bloom and mulberry is so bad in vegas it was banned years ago it's the worst pollen yeah it did it's banned from planting these trees and uh, because it's really really that bad people have started to talk about it a little bit it's like oh is your dog itching is your cat itching i'm itching so anyway so we like to keep an of course licking is a normal thing when they're grooming themselves but when it's excessive then you know you've got to be careful with that but here's my tip of the week and guess what jim we're talking about poo again. <laughs> Why? Diarrhea. You can never get enough of that with dogs. <laughs> Diarrhea. They poo every day. It's important that you know, understand their poop, because that will tell you a lot poop about their health. Poop always happens. But diarrhea. Uh-oh. So, what can you do for diarrhea? Yeah? Slippery elm. Have you ever heard of it, Jim? Yes, I have. Have you? Yes, I have. Whoa! It is a herb. Do you know what? It's the a bark. Do you know what the people use? Do you know what the real name for slippery elm slippery is? Slippery elm bark. No. What? Ulmus fulva. Oh, the Latin name, you mean? Oh, didn't you study Latin? I did in 
Manish Manam Lavat. <laughs> what does that mean? One hand washes the other. How would you say that again? Manus Manum Lavat. Manus Manum Lavat. Lawat. Lawat with a W. Yeah. Lawat. Oh, interesting. Well, there you go. Worth those uh, Latin lessons, Jim. <laughs> Cautus lupus metuit foeam. What does that mean? The cautious wolf fears the pitfall. <laughs> this is amazing. Elef Why have you never... I know you studied Latin, Elefantus but you've never... Elephantus non caput morum. What does that mean? The elephant does not fear the mouse. <laughs> this is fascinating, Jim. I like the I like the animal references. Yeah. I like that. A lot, a lot of those came from there. I'm into uh, that. From fable. Very good. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. So slippery on. Almost vulva. In vinum obum brator. What does that one mean? In wine is the truth. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Okay. Well, let's get on with slippery arm. Yeah. It's been used as a herbal remedy in North America for centuries. Native Americans use slippery elm in healing salves for wounds, boils, ulcers, burns, and skin inflammation. And it was also taken orally to relieve coughs, sore throats, diarrhea, and stomach problems. By the way, this little article came from Dr. Karen Becker. We love her. Um, and I'm also going to have a link for you in the notes, not just on Slippery Elm, but also where you can purchase Slippery Elm. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to have some things at home, some home remedies that you can, you know, you've got an instant diarrhea situation. You go, oh, okay, we can, we can use this. Just go outside your Slippery Elm tree and grab some bark. Chew on it. Don't. Don't Why? do that. Why? <laughs> That's not how it works, Jim. Mm. <laughs> it's not how it works. <laughs> Well, Slippery Elm contains mucilage. I actually don't like that word very much by the sounds of that. A substance that becomes a slick gel when mixed with water. It coats and soothes the mouth, throat, stomach, and intestines, while the herb's tannins are astringent, making Slippery Elm al ideal to soothe inflammations, reduce swelling, and heal damaged tissues. And it may also contain antioxidant on antioxidants that can help relieve inflammatory bowel conditions. Now, even though there has been little scientific research on slippery elm, it is used to relieve gastrointestinal conditions, diarrhea, IBD, IBS, and that's inf inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, and that because colitis is the inflammation of the colon. But there is some s there is some re supporting uh, research, and I will put the link on here as well. But the British Herbal Pharmacopoeia and um, Guildford and King's Lynn. There's actually there's quite a bit down here. There's quite a bit. There's some stuff from Canada as well. So there's some references to that. But I think there's also that, uh, what's the word, anecdotal evidence of, you know, you've used it and this is your experience. And, you know, a lot of people can't be wrong. Do yeah. you mean personal experience? So uh, that's very common in the, in the herbal remedy world. Well, it comes um, in a, you can get it in a powdered form. And so I'm going to link that for you guys in case you want to put that in your arsenal of, you know, um, what's the word? Like almost like your little first aid kit. Do you know what I mean? Right. What is Twix doing? Licking. He's making a heck of a lot of noise. How can one little dog make that much He'll noise? He'll settle down. <laughs> He's making so much noise. What is he like? All right. So there you go. There's your slippery elm. So that's something you can have in your arsenal and you know, ready to go. And I probably should do a show on that. You know, a first aid kit, I think is really important. A first aid kit, particularly if you travel, a first aid kit and some bits and pieces you can have in there, ready at your fingertips should you need them. Now, here's another thing in our weekly update. As you know, I designed notebooks, animal-themed notebooks, because who doesn't love a cute notebook with a cute animal on the front? Well, our meow book is already out. Our wolf book is already out. The Twin Weeks is already out, which is the guinea pig book. And if you've got a guinea pig, you know what weeking is. So it's, it's Twin Weeks, and it's two guinea pigs on the front. And I've just come out with, oh, no, I have one with Thornton's face, a watercolor that I painted of Thornton. And then my fifth book, no, I've actually got eight books. But I've got two meows, which are blue and pink. I've got two wolves, blue and pink. And then I've got, oh, I completely forgot. I've got more books than that. I'm lying to you guys. I've got two bunny books out right now. 
for my bunny people. And then I just came out with a hedgehog. Hedgehog love book. It's so cute and adorable. Now the hedgehog and the the hedgehog and the Thornton book, yeah. Yeah. Are eight by tens. Well, they're big. So they're my bigger notebooks, and uh, actually they'll be arriving at my house soon because I want to be able to have some on hand. But you'll be able to pick them all, all up on Amazon, and I will link again in the notes. So my goal is going to – you know what my goal is for this year, Jim? I'm, I'm on track, I think. I'm doing pretty well from when I started it. And I didn't start it at the top of the year, but it's to have a, a new notebook design every single week. Very good. So what I would like to hear from you listeners – since you all love animals, what animal do you want to see next on my notebooks? Because I think there are some animals that are neglected, like the hedgehog, like the sloth. And all of the reptile family. The llama, the snakes. You don't find notebooks. Lizards. You don't find notebooks with those on. They're oh, cute. Do you know what I mean? The raccoon and the opossum. Oh, Heather. I love possums. I have a love-hate with the raccoons, you know, having been attacked by one. <laughs> attacked by a raccoon. Remember the duck that attacked me at Chatsworth? It didn't it's attack you. It's just my ice cream. It didn't attack you. It wanted your ice cream. It went for my hand. Well, because you tried to defend your ice cream. <laughs> well, there you go. That's, would called, you, would that's you, called an attack. Would you defend yourself from something Mr. Twix was going to eat? Oh, heck no. I'm not stupid with that. <laughs> Which reminded me this morning. He got a little bit too cheeky this morning when Thornton having a breakfast. And he tried to have her dinner, her breakfast before she'd finished. She, she went, <laughs> she was not having it. Mm. And he, did he back off? He backed off like, oh, okay, I'll wait to lick your, he licks a bowl every morning. Um, and she actually started licking his now when they both finished, but yeah, she, she gave him a little warning, which is rare, you will see that from Thornton, but she was mm -hmm. like, no, come on, let me have my breakfast if you don't mind. A uh, bit of privacy. <laughs> and I do feed him separate, but he came trundling in through the house. I'm having the rest of her breakfast. And yeah, he was wrong. <laughs> He's totally wrong. Well, Jim, shall we? Do we need to take a break now before my big topic or after? We can now. Let's do We're it. We're 17 minutes in. Let's do it now. Let's do it now. Let's do our, our break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about Cushing's disease in dogs and the ultimate guide to understanding symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment for the best care of your dog by Dr. Julie Busby, who I was in touch with this morning, and um, I was planning on doing this show, and then, like magic, I was done, done a lot of reading, taking a lot of notes, and then like magic, boom, she sends an article about Cushing's disease, and I thought, are you kidding me? And it was weird, because I say our friend Odie was recently diagnosed with Cushing's, and although Dr. Busby is not Odie's vet... When he was visiting Blog Pause a couple of years ago, when he wasn't well at Blog Pause, she looked after him while he was there. She helped uh, his mum out. So there's a funny little connection going on there. Isn't that amazing how the universe works? So I reached out. I said, oh, can I actually reference your article? It's such a great article. And she was like, absolutely. So I thought that was wonderful of her um, to say yes to this this really, really good, like I say, ultimate guide to understanding the symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment of Cushing's. So on that note, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we will uh, discuss this whole Cushing's disease. You're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll and dogs. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Pet Scene Magazine is dedicated to Las Vegas pets and the people who love them. It's a source of news and information for pet lovers, as well as offering valuable coupons and specials on pet products and services. Find them online at www.lvpetscene.com or look for them on Facebook. Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets. People. Pop culture. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio with me, Sam, your host, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And just before we break, I said we were going to talk about Cushing's disease in dogs. Now, my little friend, Odie, and it's taken a really long time for him to finally get diagnosed. And his mom had visited a few different veterinarians. And finally, 
she ended up going to VECC, which is the most amazing facility that we have in town. In fact, we've got four now, I think. And um, gosh, such highly trained professionals. It, they've got the equipment they have is unbelievable. The services they provide, like their blood bank for animals, incredible. And so um, finally she gets there and she finally gets she finally gets a diagnosis. And it was like, yay, now we can do treatment and now we can improve the quality of his life. Now, what happened was, you know, there were some things, obviously some very, very uh, visual, obviously things that she'd, she'd seen, you know, that was obvious, like something's going on. Like he lost his hair and his skin was going a really weird color, you know. So he wasn't particularly thriving, you know, in this picture of health. And it was really concerning. Um, but it was good to get the diagnosis, and I have to report, Jim, all of his hair grew back, and it's fabulous. Very good. Yeah, so with the right treatment and stuff, she's she's definitely gotten, got him in the right place. He's had a tough two years as little Odie. Yeah, he really did, but he's doing so incredibly well right now. So here we go. So I say Dr. Julie Busby, and she's fantastic, and we love her. We connected with her uh, a few years ago in Nashville, um, at a at a conference, uh, an animal conference, and just instantly liked her. I think she kind of liked our group because we we just shown up and we started drinking wine. So <laughs> we just said, "Come on over, join us," you know. And and what we figured was she's she's a an integrative veterinarian, but she also created a product called Toe Grips that we're going to talk about that shortly, which kind of dovetails into this particular topic. And we just instantly got on with her, and we've just been friends ever since. And she's a great veterinarian. She really is. She has an amazing video on how to cut your pet's toenails. Oh, I mean, amazing. And she has another one. I want to say it's 10 touches that you would do with your pet so you can assess assess their health. It's really good. I will find it for you and put a link in there. But this is, this is her article that uh, I said I, I read. This morning, after already planning and putting my notes together and this, that, and the other, and it's just the icing on the cake, this this uh, article. So she wrote here, and this is on her blog. Oh, actually, would you find for me um, Dr. Busby's blog, Jim? I, I think it might be drbusbystoegrips.com, I think. Anyway, she wrote, have you ever heard of Cushing's disease in dogs? And that she says, I asked my new veterinary client, and who's a proud owner of a 15-year-old lab, and sitting on the floor of the exam room with me, my client shook her head. No. Are you worried my dog has that too? And as she said, as I was rubbing her lab's belly, I sensed my client's fear and worry. I had just met her dog 40 minutes prior, listened to the 15-year-old dog's health history, read through 32 pages of medical history, and was now con conducting the physical exam. I'd just finished sharing a long explanation of two other conditions that I thought her dog had, and that was hip dysplasia and laryngeal paralysis. Now, we were discussing Cushing disease in dogs, and I suspected her canine companion had this condition too. I sincerely apologize for overwhelming her, but she smiled and said, I appreciate it. I'm glad there are people like you who can help. and We find this so interesting. <laughs> and she said, I laughed. Cushing's disease in dogs, also known as hyperadrenocorticism, is not necessarily what I'd call interesting, but because this syndrome is fairly common in senior dogs who make up the majority of the patients in her practice, it is critically important to me, she said, and if you have a senior dog, it may be important to you. Cushing's disease typically occurs in middle-aged to senior dogs. And what is Cushing's disease? In the most basic terms, Cushing's disease occurs when the body produces too much stress hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is the body's natural steroid and is absolutely essential for day-to-day -day life. The body regulates cortisol levels very carefully. When cortisol gets out of whack, bad things can happen. And as dogs age, they can develop small tumors that cause excess release of cortisol. These tumors are usually in the brain. Do not fear, though, she said. While the phrase brain tumor is frightening when used in the same sentence with our beloved dogs, these tumors are usually small and do not spread. Instead, they disturb the normal secretion of homo hormones in the body. The end result is too much cortisol. This is the case in about 80% of dogs with Cushing's disease. In the other 20% of dogs, a tumor grows on the adrenal gra gland. 
There are small bean-shaped organs found just above the kidneys. However, the end result is essentially the same. These tumors also lead to elevated levels of cortisol in the body. Playing the odds, I suspected my lab patient had a small brain tumor called a pituitary macroadenoma. Adenoma. But let's back up for a second, she says. Why did I suspect Cushing's disease in my patient? In my discussion with the dog's owner, she had mentioned increased thirst, urination, and panting. These are three cardinal symptoms. And while I spoke with her, I sat rubbing the thin skin of the dog's pot belly. Yes, cardinal symptoms four and five. So the symptoms of Cushing's disease in dogs are what? And she said, if you've ever taken a steroid, for example, prednisone, for a medical condition, you may have felt restless or had an increased appetite. The symptoms of Cushing's disease in dogs are similar to some of the side effects experienced by human patients who are taking steroids. Symptoms of Cushing's disease include restlessness, panting, possible behavior changes, increased drinking and urinating, increased appetite, and weight gain. Excessive thirst is one of the more common signs of Cushing's disease in dogs. Also, dogs with Cushing's disease are prone to infections, and mostly these manifest in recurrent skin infections called pyoderma and urinary tract infections. So there are some other noticeable signs of Cushing's in dogs, and that is their pot-bellied appearance, thinning skin, weakness, muscle wasting. And because of sudden muscle mass and the loss of that, the sudden loss of muscle mass, a dog with arthritis may suddenly worsen. Additionally, hair may fall out and a dog may suddenly have skin changes like a teenager. So she says, as a veterinarian, I will give a dog a thorough physical examination as the first step in diagnosing Cushing's disease. As an integrated veterinarian, I believe that knowledge is power. In order to intelligently discuss a dog's prognosis, which is your expected outcome, and a treatment plan, I begin by confirming the diagnosis. I recommend that my client starts with a simple test called a urine cortisol creatinine ratio, and that is known as a UCCR. This is an interesting test. Okay, maybe she does find it interesting, she says, because it's collected at home and rules out the diagnosis rather than ruling it in. So she said, let me explain that, what that means. Uh, so to test, uh, testing to rule out Cushing's, first the test measures cortisol in a urine sample. Cortisone is the hormone overproduced in Cushing's syndrome. But animals and people naturally produce it as part of a healthy response to stress. For best results, the urine sample is collected at home. This way, the dog doesn't get anxious from a visit to the vet clinic and secrete a bunch of cortisol because of that stress, and then it can skew those results. Second, the test doesn't prove that a dog has Cushing's disease. On the contrary, all it can tell us is that a dog does not have Cushing's disease, thus ruling out the diagnosis. And it may seem counterintuitive, but it's actually quite valuable. Granted, if the results are elevated, more tests will be required because Cushing's was not confirmed but remains likely. If the UCCR is normal, we can cross Cushing's off the list as a possible diagnosis and move on to the next thing. So testing to confirm Cushing's disease. So test to rule in Cushing's disease, and basically that is to confirm the diagnosis, are blood tests. There are three options. The ACTH stimulation test, a low-dose suppression test, or a high-dose suppression test. Your veterinarian may also ask for a urine sample to look for evidence of urinary tract infection, which can be silent and accompany Cushing's disease, especially in those female dogs. Sometimes the results are still not conclusive. And in order to nail the diagnosis, abdominal ultrasounds, urine cultures, x-rays of the chest, Further blood work and more tests may be recommended. And um, what are these options? So say you've gone confirmed, what on earth are these options? So she says, of course, my client's next question is, what happens if my dog is diagnosed with Cushing's? I explained that diagnostics were the next step and we shouldn't jump to conclusions. But to address her question, I did explain a bit about how Cushing's is managed. 
In most cases, Cushing's is a lifelong disease. Treatment requires careful monitoring with your veterinarian. It is a commitment. And she says it can be daunting. So she's not going to lie to you. You've got to really commit to this management. However, she said there are many treatment and management options. Managing Cushing's with medication. She says since over 80% of dogs diagnosed with Cushing's disease have tumors in their brain that are very small, management with medication is usually the preferred route. Veteral, veteral, and that is also known as trilostane, is currently the only veterinary, ap- veterinary approved product on the market that treats both pituitary and adrenal dependent forms of the disease. Another drug called lysodren, and that's also known as mitotane, targets the adrenal glands, which are overproducing this cortisol, and it inhibits them. Now, dogs taking medications such as veteral must be monitored very closely with frequent lab work because the medication can work too well and cause the opposite condition, hypoadrenocorticism, ACA, Addison's disease, which you've heard of that too, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've got the opposite ends of the spectrum, then you don't want to trigger going into Addison's. Follow-up blood work with your veterinarian will be necessary. In the interest of full disclosure, this can represent a significant financial and time commitment. So you'll probably have to budget or make sure that you're on a good pet insurance, which, by the way, in a couple of weeks, we're going to bring someone on from uh, Embrace Pet Insurance because we, I think it is people are unsure how pet insurance works or what it even covers. So uh, we're going to have someone come on the show and talk about that. So that's something you may want to consider if you don't have pet insurance. Now, um, uh, Selegiline and off-label medications. Also, Selegiline is approved to treat Cushing's disease, but only in the case of pituitary tumors. There are other off-label medications, such as mitotain and melatonin. However, these are not approved and must be used with care and with the understanding that they may not be that effective. So there's also a surgery, and she says, when would that be necessary? So if an adrenal tumor is the cause of Cushing's, the affected gland can be removed through surgery. It is not a simple surgery and is ideally performed by a board-certified surgeon. Risk of hemorrhage is significant. Thus, many owners opt to treat their dogs with medical management to avoid the cost cost and risk of surgery. So you always have to weigh up, you know, the risks, the pros and the cons. And how to comfort a dog with Cushing's disease. And I think this is a really good segment here because what else can you do aside from medication? And uh, she says, always have fresh water available. Cushing's causes increased thirst and urination. So your dog will want to drink more and need to go out more frequently for your potty break. So you just have to change your routine a little bit. But fresh water constantly is going to be a good thing. Uh, Keep a vigilant eye out for signs of skin and urinary tract infections, which should be promptly treated. Your veterinarian may prescribe antifungal and antibacterial shampoos and wipes to proactively help combat combat skin conditions, skin infections, sorry. Watch for signs of urinary issues such as increased frequency of urination, foul odor to the urine, straining to urinate and, and or blood in the urine. And if you observe any of these signs, take your dog to the vet. Whatever you do, just don't delay. And for dogs with Cushing's, urinary tract infections are nearly impossible to prevent. So there's a lot of management that has to go on. Now, there's another thing that comes along with Cushing's disease, and that is mobility issues. If your dog is having mobility issues due to muscle wasting, look for options to minimize discomfort and falling. Keep your dog on carpet, avoid slick floors, and manage any concurrent arthritic pain. And she said she's had several patients with muscle wasting due to Cushing's syndrome, and they thrive using toe grips. And this is what she she created. Busby so Dog Podcast. The Busby Dog Podcast. Oh, the podcast is very good. But that's not the main website, though. Mm. But the podcast, absolutely listen to the podcast. It's called. And we'll link that in as well. Um she came up with these toe grips. Now this is not this is not a shoe. It's not something you spray on the foot. It is something that goes over the nail. There's a very specific way in which it goes on because, as she explained to me in the past, it is so important to have the dog have full contact with the pad. It's because there's so much Im- uh, information and proprioception that goes on through the feet that if you put a coating on it 
if you put a um, you know a boot on the foot, they're going to lose some of that ability. And it's so important that they can actually really connect with the floor. So toe grips go over the nail. Yeah, they don't cover the entire nail. And it's really important how you put them on. But I've seen them in action, and they change the lives of dogs. Any dog that's having mobility issues, they're getting older, they can't get up, you've got slippery floors, they've had a surgery, uh, tripod pets, you know, pets who have, have had to have an amputation, it's going to aid them in that. So I will link these two because it's so important. And I'm so glad she brought this up because she said, you know, the non-slip grips fit on dog's toenails to improve traction on hardwood floors, preventing sliding and falling. Uh, her before and after videos are great. Before toe grips and after. Shop.toegrips.com. Shop.toegrips.com. I will link it all out for you. Anyway, dogs with cushions may have this difficulty gaining traction on these slippery surfaces. And so toe grips, non-slip grips can help. And she's saying can, they will help. They're amazing. Anyway, um, uh, so where are we going next? Here we go. She also talked about um, other ways to improve your dog's mobility. And she said soft bedding. Consider a memory foam dog bed. Avoiding stairs therapeutic laser and physical therapy i know that alicia bought herself a laser uh, that he, she a light uh, a light oh, what's the name of it uh, but it's a light treatment and she uses it at home and so i know that she added that in and she said you know teaching your dog to use ramps so they're not jumping up and down and uh, she said uh, she does she does feel that dogs with cushions would benefit from a f from foam a foam bed which I think is, uh, you know, the more comfort you can give them, the better. Um, and she says, if your dog's been diagnosed with Cushing's disease, there is hope. You, you know, there is definitely hope. Cushing's disease in dogs is not a hopeless diagnosis, but it is a disease that requires careful and observant monitoring, both by you and your veterinarian. And those regular veterinary checks with blood work and urine testing should be expected. Despite all this, a dog with Cushing's disease can have an excellent quality of life and live to a ripe old age. And Odie is living proof right now. And, of course, I'll, I'll post some, some pictures of him on our, on our Facebook so you can see his before and afters. And his mom, and along with her vet, have got it down. And the quality of his life is fantastic right now. I'm so happy. When I saw his hair grow back, I thought, this is amazing. But it took her a really long time and going through a few different vets till she got the right one that said, ah, this is what we suspect. And she said, I'm optimistic that my sweet senior lab patient has many happy years ahead. I look forward to partnering with his mom to provide him the longest, healthiest life possible through appropriate veterinary diagnostics and treatment. Now, uh, let me just quickly, I, I've just got a bullet point summary for you, you know, just, you know, just so you can kind of recap a little bit. Symptoms of Cushing's disease in dogs, restlessness, panting, possible behavior changes, increased drinking, increased appetite, weight gain, that pot-bellied appearance, thinning skin and skin changes, weakness, muscle wasting, and hair loss. Diagno uh, diagnosing Cushing's, first and foremost, please speak to your veterinarian, of course. Most likely, he or she will suggest a physical examination and then recommend further testing. And your treatment options are, because it's a lifelong disease, is careful monitoring by your vet. Generally, medication is your preferred treatment plan. However, in some cases, as an adrenal tumor, tre treatment may include surgery. And there are four ways to comfort your dog who has Cushing's, and that's fresh water available because they are drinking a lot. Keep a vigilant eye out for signs of skin and urinary tract infections, which should be treated promptly. If your dog is having mobility issues due to muscle wasting, look for options to minimize discomfort and falling. And that's the toe grips. It's a... Uh, uh, rugs, it's yoga mats are fantastic to give your pets um, some traction. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think that's a fantastic article, don't you think, Jim? Very good. It's really, really, really good. Informative, and you once again got all your big words in. Um, oh, you know what? I just got a message from Dr. Busby. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh my gosh. Um, but um, I'm just having a quick, you know, quick scan through. Um. Oh, she says, let me know if I can support you anyway. Oh, she's fantastic. We love Dr. Busby. And I think she likes how much fun we like to have when we all get together. 
she's got a lot of children too and it was like this woman is amazing she's running a veterinary clinic she's got this great product she's got all these kids and she smiles every day <laughs> she's amazing she's absolutely amazing so thank you dr busby for uh letting us share that on air and um she said you know there is also an atypical form uh, that she didn't get into in the article, but maybe I can grab some information up, uh, from her on that, and we'll uh, we'll do that in a later show. But there you go. So look out for those signs if you've noticed some of them. And I have seen people say, you know, oh, my dog, he has no pro problem hydrating. He drinks all the time. It's like, ooh, like excessively. I'm like, there's something going on there. Now, now, my dogs, they just like to steal my water. <laughs> They're not drinking excessively, but they see me walking in the glass, and they go, oh, yeah, thanks for that glass of water. So... <laughs> I'm the dehydrated one around here. But uh, big thank you, Dr. Busby. So appreciate that. Well, moving on to some news, Jim. Some breaking news. I'm not surprised by this, I'll be honest with you. And I don't think anyone um, will be surprised by this. But breaking news, Animal Kingdom Pet Store in California and two suspicious Iowa-based rescues sued for breaking California law that bans retail sale of dogs from puppy mills and breeders. Our friends over at the Animal Legal Defense Fund uh, filed a lawsuit against the Animal Kingdom Pet Store and purported uh, rescue groups Bark Adoptions and Rescue Pets Iowa for participating in a puppy laundering scheme to unlawfully circumvent the California law that bans the sale of dogs from commercial breeders, commonly called puppy mills. The law went into effect January 1, 2019. <laughs> so it wasn't, it was only a few weeks ago, friends. Uh, and it requires pet stores to obtain animals only from public animal control agencies, animal shelters, or federally registered 501c3 rescue groups that do not obtain animals from breeders or brokers for compensation. Despite the ban, Animal Kingdom has continued to sell eight-week-old purebred and designer puppies for over $2,000 into 2019. The store identifies the source of these puppies as Bark Adoptions, a newly formed group that incorporated in November 2018 and filed its registration for state nonprofit status in January the 19th, on January 19th in 2019. According to the IRS website, Bark Adoptions is not a federally registered 501c3 nonprofit. The Animal Legal Defense Fund's lawsuit, filed on behalf of nonprofit organizations Bailing Out Benji and a Corporation for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, alleges Animal Kingdom is circumventing the law and misleading consumers by using Bark Adoptions as a middleman to launder puppies commercially bed, bred for profit and labeling them as rescue animals. Mm. The lawsuit alleges that Bark ad uh, Adoptions obtains puppies from Rescue Pet Iowa based in Ottawa, Iowa. Puppy mills are cruel and see animals as cash crops, breeding mother dogs constantly regardless of their health or veterinary needs, said Stephen Wells, our friend over at Animal Legal Defense Fund. He's the executive director over there. Retail pet sale bans, like California's, are intended to combat puppy mills and their deplorable practices. Attempts to circumvent these laws will not go unchallenged. And they're on it. Boom. They're on it straight away. California was the first state to pass a pet retail sale ban in 2017, with Maryland following in 2018. We would have had our ban starting the beginning of 2018, had our commissioners, councilmen, I think it's our councilmen, city council members. didn't take some rather large donations to all of a sudden overturn our ban that was to go into effect on that January 1, 2018. Yes, that's right. And the trouble is, donations do not show up on the Secretary of State's website until, oh, is it? It's either three months, either two or three months later, or maybe even longer. So you can't track how people are being swayed by certain donations. So ours got overturned. It was not. It was not. It was not a good thing. It was a bad, bad day. Oh, and one of those councilmen, because there were two that that really were going for it and took big donations, he just stepped down recently. I haven't been watching the some news kind for some a week, kind of so. harassment claim. 
Wow, good yeah. for him. I'm like, you know what? Maybe that's a little karma if it's true. Yeah, good for him. So, so that was real such a blow because everybody works so hard on that. Anyway, um, it is the first state. Maryland is followed by uh, many major cities have instituted similar laws, including Chicago and Philadelphia. And uh, I'd like to add that it comes uh, from me, no surprise to anyone in the rescue world that this would happen. We talked about it because people always like to find a way when it comes to making money. However, this will lead to, I believe, in in a way that this is a silver lining, and I'm glad that it's happening sooner than later, but it will lead to regulation of rescues. And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. You know, where are your dogs coming from? You know, and, and there, there's got to be checks and balances. It's an unregulated industry, and this is the kind of stuff that could happen. But you know what? They're on it straight away, and uh, wow, how cheeky of them! They applied. What was it? The end of end of January. <laughs> Four weeks later, they just got busted. Yeah, and you know, let me tell you something: Animal Legal Defense Fund, incredible organization of of attorneys working pro bono all over the country for animals, representing animals. They are phenomenal, uh, and not just in not just in the rescue world. It's in in farming. I mean, uh, circus. Uh, you name it fantastic absolutely fantastic so as much as it's a horrible thing it's got it's got picked up very quickly it might scare a few others into not doing it and i think it will eventually lead to some kind of um legislation of some kind so there you go well jim i think i have one more thing i want to talk about do you have anything you want to talk about oh you know what what um tomorrow no t- hang on not tomorrow it's sunday Hang on, I had a little note here. It's been a busy week, hasn't it, Jim? Do you want to tell everybody what you're doing later on today? I'm uh, heading down to uh, Laughlin, Nevada. To do what? To play concert with the Four Tops. Oh, aren't you fancy? The what four are their famous tops. songs, Jim? Bernadette. What's that one? I don't think I'm... Do I know that one? Bernadette's one of their big hits. Also, uh... You can sing it? You're going to sing no, it? No, I'm not going to sing it. You're going to sing it? No, I'm not going to sing it. Well, later on today, well, actually after... I'll be there. Actually, after the show, we're going to take a little quick trip down to Bark in the Park, see some of our friends who are set up as vendors, take tons of pictures of really, really cute cute pets that are out there. Um, hopefully, um, it'll be nice weather. It's a little bit windy at the moment. Um, <laughs> so I hope everybody brings sandbags to hold their booths down. But I will... Um, I'll probably do... I'll probably do some interviews with a couple of people down there and um, certainly take a lot of pictures. And then Jim will... Jim will leave me. You're going to go with Pete, the best trumpeter in the world and a pickleball champion. Pickleball Pete. Anyone that's listening, tell everybody what pickleball is, Jim. I never heard of it in my well, life. I asked Pete years ago, what's pickleball? And he goes, tennis for old people. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a tennis racket. It's like a paddle. Oh, I'm sorry. It's like paddle ball He's on a, a mini tennis court. serious athlete. Yeah, but that's what he said it is. He's shredded. Yeah. Oh, I, you know when you said old people, I felt... Uh, you meant as in, oh, it's not difficult. That's what I thought, but no, no, it's unbelievable. It's highly competitive nationwide. It's actually becoming a global phenomenon. Is it really? People all over the world connect through pickleball. <laughs> Interesting. Do you remember I got him that little pickle and made him a, a racket? Mm-hmm. <laughs> pickleball Pete. So that's who Jim's playing with. He's also an incredible trumpet player. And he has, um, do they have a name for their organization where they go and play taps for military funerals? Oh gosh, I forgot the name of it. But yeah, there's nothing a worse than trump- a pre- trumpet players here in Las Vegas have a, a society, and they uh, they play taps for military funerals for free. Yeah, so they do not have to play some recorded version of it. That they go, and it's it's such an incredible thing that they do, and it's um, amazing, really, really amazing. But yeah, we love pickleball, Pete. <laughs> so Jim gets to hang out with with pickleball. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, and so what I'm going to do, actually, c- I, there's another thing I'm doing later on as well. So, you know, after the show, we're going to run down to Bark in the Park. But then later on tonight, um, you may not know this, but we have a hockey team, ice hockey team. Um, what do you mean you may not know this? Everybody knows about the Las Vegas hockey do team. Do they really? Yes, they're world anyway, famous. They call the Golden Knights. Anyway, um, where we're ha- having our v- um, event at uh, Three Sheets. They're also doing a viewing party for the Southern Nevada Beagle Rescue. So we have a viewing party. There's some raffle stuff and whatever. You so uh, if you're out and about, it starts at 6 o'clock. It's a free event. And you can come on down to Three Sheets Craft Beer Bar here in Las Vegas. So that's later on tonight. 
Um, so I said, this is how we're going to wrap up the show, Jim. Chihuahuas. We're going to talk about the history of chihuahuas. Chihuahuas. Oh. Here's Wawa. We have some, a lot of friends uh, whose favorite we dog do. is chihuahua. We do. There's a guy, on, I've forgotten what part of the country he's in, but he's, he's rescued. He's got like 30 of these little chihuahuas that are living in his house. Mm. And I sent a link over to our friend Patricia, who loves a chihuahua. Who has lots of chihuahuas. I said, oh, look, I found you a boyfriend. <laughs> I said, I think I found you the perfect guy. Anyway, Chihuahuas. So, it's the smallest breed of dog and is named after the state of Chihuahua in Mexico. Comes in a variety of colors and two coat lengths. Now, here's the history. It is a bit convoluted, but they say the Chihuahua history is convoluted and many theories surround the origin of the breed. Both folklore and archaeological finds show that the breed has origins in Mexico. The most common theory is that Chihuahua Chihuahuas are descended from the Tichichi, oh, do I love that word, Tichichi, a companion dog favored by the Toltec civilization in Mexico. No records of the Tichichi are available before the 9th century, although dog parts from the Colima, Mexi from Colima, Mexico, buried as part of the Western Mexico Shaft tomb tradition, which date back to 300 BC, are thought to depict Tichichis, the earlier ancestors, I have to say it like that, Tichichis, the earlier ancestor ancestors probably were present before the Mayas as dogs pr approximating the Chihuahua are found in materials from the Great Pyramid of Cholula. You like that word, Jim. I love Cholula myself. And, and to My dating, favorite sauce. And to dating 1530 and in the ruins of Chichen Itza. On the been there. On the Yucatan Pen Peninsula. And I knew you had been there. I climbed the pyramid before they stopped people doing that. Oh, really? Mm. You're so fancy. Yeah. However, <laughs> genetic evidence reveals very little pre-European genetics in modern chihuahuas, less than 2%, suggesting that interbreeding with European dogs has left little of the original American lineage while possibly retaining a similar form. And they said that wheeled dog toys in... Mesoamerica range from Mexico to El Salvador. Huh? That, that didn't make sense at all, that sentence. Real dog toys in Mesoamerica range from Mexico. Oh, they're toys, dog toys. <laughs> they're dog toys that you can buy that look like them. Anyway, the earliest of these were found in uh, Tres Zapotes in Veracruz, Mexico, which date to 100 AD. Indirect evidence that a chihuahua-like breed was in Mexico over 14 hundred years before the first Europeans arrived. And dog effigy parts dating to around 1325 AD discovered in Georgia and Tennessee also appeared to represent the Chihuahua. In 1850, that feels a little bit more recent for me, yeah, than 1325 AD. Uh, <laughs> in 1850, a pot featuring the Chihuahua-like dogs was unearthed in old ruins at Casas Grandes in me the Mexican state of Chihuahua which dates from 1100 to 1300 A.D., showing the long history of such dogs at this site, although most artifacts relating to its existence are found around Mexico City. It has been argued that these parts arrived with survivors from the Casas Grandes site in Chihuahua, Mexico, after it was attacked and destroyed around 1340 A.D. Now, in eight... Oh, we're going all over the place here. In 1520, in a 1520 letter... Hernan Cortes wrote that the Aztecs raised and sold the little dogs as food. Oh, I don't like that bit. I don't like that bit at all. Colon How much meat are you going to get off a chihuahua? Seriously. Maybe that's all they had. Move on with this story. Yeah, but weren't there other animals they could have eaten? Mm. They yeah. could have eaten chupacabras. <laughs> oh, yeah, you get a lot more meat off a chupacabra. <laughs> If they could catch it. If they could catch the, m the, the mythical, or even th they say it could be. Is that a bit like a Bigfoot kind of story? No, because Bigfoot's a big, giant beast. Oh, okay. The Chupacabra's a little, wiry monster. It is? Yeah. I thought it was big. No. Anyway, colonial records refer to small, nearly hairless dogs at the beginning of the 19th century, one of which claims 16th century con conquistadors, what a great word, found them plentiful in the region later known as Chihuahua. Small dogs such as Chihuahuas were also used as living hot water bottles during illness or injury. <laughs> I still use my dogs for warmth. <laughs> get in bed, put them on your belly. Oh, best feeling ever. So I totally get that. 
And what a benefit for the dog. You just get to snuggle up. That is fantastic. Some believe this practice is where the idea of pain being transferred. Oh, I don't like this bit. There's some history can be cruel. Some, be some believe this practice is where the idea of pain being transferred to animals from humans originated, which gave way to rituals such as burning the deceased with live dogs. This is going south. Woo! Such as the Tachichi to exonerate the deceased human sins. Why should the dog have to deal with that? Ugh. Strange Mexican Catholic origins. Wow. Sounds like. Chihuahuas as we know them today remain a rarity. Remained a rarity until the early 20th century. The American Kennel Club did not register a Chihuahua until 1904. Oh, I didn't like that bit. Anyway, here's a description. If you haven't seen a Chihuahua. We have loads here. Oh my gosh, we have loads. We, the, the, uh, we have more chihuahuas and pit bulls. That they're the two breeds that you'll see in our shelters the most. They're such great dogs. Yeah, but we have a load of them, don't we, Jim? Yeah. Anyway, chihuahuas are the smallest breed recognized by some kennel clubs. There are two varieties, and uh, that's the smooth coat, which is your short head, and your long coat, which is a long head. Duh, figure that one out. Anyway, both the smooth and long coats have their special attractions and are easily, equally easy to keep clean and well-groomed. UK Kennel Club considers the two as distinct breeds, mating between the two are not eligible for cases. Who cares about that anyway? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Dogs of either coat type may be identified as either applehead or deerhead. And uh, you tend to hear that more in the, in the States. And so the applehead is a round head, close to eyes and relatively short ears and legs. And deerheads have flat top flat topped heads, more widely set eyes, larger ears and longer, more slender legs. While deer heads were popular in the mid 20th century, the current breed standards defined by registries such as the AKC specify the apple head co conformation. Here's the thing. Let me tell you something about these kennel clubs. Yeah. And I think it's really important to know this because, you know, when people are like, oh, I've got to go to a breeder because I'm going to get a better dog. Here's the thing. When you get a certificate of a breed, yeah, by a club, it's just telling you your dog has the characteristics of, for example, a chihuahua. This is what it looks like. We're confirming that it looks like. So it's more of a certificate of looks. is not a guarantee of health. And I think that's a really important to think about because they don't really tell you that. You know, I'm not to say, like, legitimately good breeders don't have healthy dogs, but it's still a certificate of looks. It's like registering your car down the DMV and you're saying, I've got... You know, I've got a mini and it's red and this is the year it is. And I can you know, can now identify my vehicle. It's registered the look of my vehicle, the the age of my vehicle. That's it, friends. That's it. it do, you're not saying, you know, it's, it's safe to run <laughs> or whatever. Or it's in good shape. It's about looks. And I think that's really important to know. It's saying this is what we say the breed should look like. I, me personally, I don't care what breed the dog is. I'll have a healthy dog. A healthy, happy dog is so much more important than that. But I do think that's important to know. So there you go. So that's, um, didn't like that last bit of history. But thankfully, that's not the case anymore. That have progressed a little bit. But I still like the idea of a hot water bottle. I never see hot water bottles here, Jim. What's that about? We have them in England. What, you what's had one when we lived in Nashville. I did? Yeah, and you used it. Why do I not remember that? Used it all the time. I never see it. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I, I can't did? believe you can't remember I that. I cannot remember that. You used it lots. Lots. We love a hot water bottle in England. Oh, my gosh, when it's cold, you put your feet on it in bed. It's the best thing ever. I've never seen one here. Why, why do I not remember using one? That's crazy to me. You used to use it all the time. Are you sure about that? Yes. Do you want me to go into why? Yeah. Back when you had your ulcer. I had my ulcer when I lived in Spain. And you also had it in Nashville. I don't even remember that. I must have blocked it out. You might have. I must have blocked it out. Yep. I love a hot water bottle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll go on Amazon, see if I can find a cute one that looks like a dog or something. You don't need to buy a hot water bottle. I love it. You know what, Jim? Seriously. No you're the first that. to put your feet on my dogs in bed. There's no need for you that. You would love a hot water bottle yourself. Do they make hot water bottles of couples that are extra long? No. <laughs> what? Oh, I've just come up with an, a brilliant invention. Uh, that is brilliant. I'm, so, I'm sorry. It is brilliant. 
one big long one on the bottom of the bed and you can all put your feet on it. Ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> but I'm going to look and see if I can find a cute one with a dog in it. I know I live in Vegas, but hey, you know, we have air conditioning on. You get in bed, it's still a bit chilly. Anyway, so that's it. That's the end of the show, my friends. So I do hope you find that the Cushing's disease is explained a little bit better, the types of treatments, the symptoms you would look for, and um, that it is not, you know, you've not lost all hope if your dog is diagnosed with Cushing's disease. Um, I will put links in, of course, to all the articles, and I'll also put links into products that we've mentioned today, like the Slippery Elm. And if I do find a hot water bottle with cute animals on it, I'll link that out as well into the, into the show notes. <laughs> now, if you have liked today's show and you're listening directly on your smartphone or your laptop, of course, it's an option. You can share the show directly with your social media networks. And, um, Jim, thank you so much for, for running the show today. And uh, thank you for my dogs being really cute, apart from wrecking my raffle prize. But it's kind of funny as well because I'm just amazed how clever he is <laughs> more than anything. But now I'm worried because I've got probably 20 raffle baskets and auction baskets in my living room that now I'm concerned about. Yep, well, you'll have to move. I'm on. a little bit worried, but thank God there's no f- no treats in any of them. Oh, my gosh, it would be even worse. He would have wrecked them all, so. Uh, and I've kind of run out of space, so that's a little bit of an issue. But we'll figure it out, won't we, Jim? I wish we had a baby gate right now. <laughs> Well, remember, you can always help an animal in need. Either rescue, adopt, donate, volunteer, or share their information. Rescue your next family member, replace the workshop with adopt, and be kind to all animals. Again, thank you, Jim. Thank you to my lovely listeners for being part of the show every single week. And today you've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio, where it's all about pets, people, and pop culture. I'm your host, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. And always kiss your pets good morning and good night. And I will see you next time. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. You've been listening to Vegas Rock Dog Radio. Pets, people, pop culture. Visit Vegas Rock Dog Radio for more information. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe on iTunes and iHeartRadio. And remember, give your fur babies a big kiss from me, Sam, the queen of rock and roll dogs. You must not rely on the information in this broadcast from our hosts as an alternative to medical advice from your veterinarian. If you have any specific questions about a medical matter regarding your pets, you should consult your veterinarian or specialist. 